to thank Guido, Anam, Bjorn, always been a great supporter. <laughs> the, uh, it feels surreal to be here. I remember us talking last year about us trying to get here and to be able to speak on how African women are presented. I have a unique position in being bi-continental, half in Uganda, half in LA. So I'd like to speak a little bit about what I do and how I've always structured it around disrupting the other. So I consider myself a cognitive disruptor, which I call one who is invested in cognitively disrupting harmful narratives that physically and emotionally hurt the other. I feel all my work is aimed against that. I'll admit I made that term up. <laughs> I decided I wanted two big words together to make me feel important. So if it doesn't make sense, do not tell me because I'm very happy with it. <laughs> to give you some background, look, that is me. I've always been a storyteller. That's me with my mom's head wrap and my dad's uh, doctor shirt that he used to wear to work. I always wanted to reflect what I saw. I was always imitating people. I was always retelling stories. And in some ways, I can look back to the age of like four or five. I was an expert at reflecting society back at itself. In some ways, that has always been what I do as an artist. I've never offered solutions in any of my art pieces. I've never told people what to think. My only aim is to reflect society back at itself. So this obsession with storytelling continued on till I was about 17. I was in high school and I wanted to act in a one woman show about an African woman. I didn't care what country she came from. So I searched in a library that had all these plays to find a play, one woman show about an African woman or a play that centered around an African woman. I did not find one. So I was 17 and I was naive. And so I was like, ta-da, I'll write one. So I wrote Jabulile, which means happiness. And the tagline was, nothing will wipe the smile off. I started interviewing street vendors about their stories because I was curious as to what laid behind their smiles. It was only then that I started to understand the struggles in being a woman from Swaziland and a greater area of African woman and how it was always connected to gender. This became the start of me becoming a feminist. Um, the show went on to do better than I ever thought it would. It toured internationally, I was just 17. But I think that was the beginning of me disrupting. That was the beginning of me disrupting what we thought of African women. And I did that by making us complex. I was one woman acting as six different characters showing the complexities, but because I was one body, showing the similarities. I went on to write another one-woman show called Kauna, which was based about Ugandan women dealing with HIV and AIDS. I was always obsessed with disrupting, because when you talked about HIV and AIDS, we got statistics, we got ABC, abstain, be faithful, condomize. That did not incorporate the African woman. I cannot abstain when there's such a high risk of me being raped. And if I'm faithful in a, in a society that does not tell men to be faithful, what good is that of me? And then they tell you to condomize. That assumes that there is equality involved, that I have a say whether a condom is being used. And so I was always obsessed with telling the story from the woman's side. And so I use, even though this is a film festival, I think it's important to go back to my place because I think that is where I started disrupting. So as I said, I, this, the, the second one woman show got invited to Grahamstown National Arts Festival, which is the biggest arts festival in Africa and second only to Edinburgh. This festival is set in South Africa. It has plays like 500, at the time I performed, it was over 500 plays. How many plays do you think were written by black African women at that festival? Just guess. Okay, you guys had less hope. <laughs> the answer is three. Well done. But the fact that you thought one out of 500 is amazing. I would have assumed, I mean, I'm an optimist, <laughs> but I would have assumed at least 100 or at least 50. There were three. I was horrified. I was, at that time, 20. And I didn't consider myself an expert. So I'm like, what are the other two, <laughs> you know? And it, it, it really, 
bothered me that there was outside of myself only two black playwrights. And so I started to make, I, it was at that point where I was like, oh, writing has to be something I continue to do because this is the only way we're gonna disrupt. So as I mentioned, I consider art as a mirror. And so it's been something that people ask me like, what is your message? I don't have a message. I simply reflect what I see. But what I quickly learned that as an African woman, reflecting what I see is inherently political. It's inherently disruptive. Because what I'm doing is showing you a world that has just refused to see it in my way. So I wanted to talk about the social hierarchy and how we disrupt. So if we consider the hierarchy, the first is Europeans, Americans, Asians, Africans. I got it from hierarchystructure.com so you don't accuse me of that. <laughs> um, <laughs> if we understand that men and then women, um, Titi talk a lot about this. So the white man inherently is at the top, the black woman is at the bottom. Me reflecting, me writing, me telling a story is disrupting that hierarchy. Because what this hierarchy says is the closer you are to the top, the more uh, proximity you have to the mic. The closer you are to the bottom, the more proximity you have as an audience member. You are supposed to receive. So me writing and any other African woman who's telling a story is disrupting this because you're grabbing a mic. You're saying, I don't care about your social hierarchy. You be the audience to my story. If I think about this idea of the mic and the audience, I have no problem being an audience member. I, I've watched plenty of American films, I've watched plenty of European films. I have no problem with it. My problem comes when I'm the audience member of my own story. That is the biggest problem I have. So, in my idea, that is where the, the stereotype is formed and that is where the other is formed. For the sake of getting on the same page, I wanted to break down the other. To me, it's, it's pretty obvious, but to go over it, the other is just a way to dehumanize. In racism, in apartheid, in slavery, black people were othered. We see it with the LGBTQI community. They are othered. We see it in religion. Muslims are othered. The reason people are othered is it allows you to do atrocious acts without having to recognize them as human. If we make them singular, if we make them one, if, if, if Muslim equals terrorist, I don't have to interact with you as a human. When you see me as complex, when you see me as multi-dimensional, when you see me similar to you, you're going to have a very hard time doing the things you do to me. And so. I just want us to understand that that is the main purpose of the other. So now I want to say how film as a medium is the perfect ground for this. So I have, an, I have a theory called because I can versus because I can't that I want to share because I want to say that presenting African women as the other saves you time and money, which as a filmmaker, is the best thing. Um, so if you understand that I'm singular, all the filmmakers in here, you understand what do you need? One scene. You only have to write one scene about me. You only have to shoot one scene. And that saves you time and money. As a filmmaker, that's fantastic. And I would say that some people even do this not maliciously, but because they can. That is the epitome of privilege. Because I can. If I, as a screenwriter, could establish a character in one scene and shoot one scene and establish a character, I wish I could. But I can't. Because I can't. That is the definition of oppression. So we understand because I can versus because I can't. So I, I like to talk about the three traits in African, African women in film. And I, I'm not just speaking in mainstream, but I also have to point out even films made by Africans sometimes incorporate mainstream because we're digesting how we're seen and you cannot be what you cannot see. And so sometimes we interpret them and then we reproduce them. So the three traits that I personally always pick up on in some form or another were queens, were warriors, or were oppressed and void of joy. They always fit into those three categories. So without one scene, we see her with a queen. Without one scene, we see her fighting 
Oh, now one scene, she's upset and dealing with some problems. And there's never complexity. There's never any complexity. My film, Chen Bu, dealt with rape. Everyone who saw it said, oh my God, I thought it was a comedy. It was in the beginning. Because that's life. It's complex. There is never a foreshadowing of rape. You don't wake up in the morning like, oh, today I'm going to get raped. That's not how it works. Otherwise, I would not get out of bed. I have a great life, and it's interrupted. And it was important for me to present the joy in Uganda, as well as the situation. So while I can present a very traumatic event, I must balance it with the complexity of life. So it's like an interesting time because a lot of people like to tell me, oh, we have so many African films, we have so many African stories. Um, even growing up, there were so many African films. I, I decided to choose the top four from the ages that I remember watching films, what I considered African films from the age of like five to 16, mainstream as well. So there was Shaka Zulu, then we had Serafina, then we had Hotel Rwanda, then we had Last King of Scotland. All of these either have like a, they, a female always was a supporting lead except for Serafina. Also, a lot of these, most of, in every single film, all the leads are American. So whilst, I, I still love Serafina, um, and whilst, the, I mean, some of these films I do not like, but <laughs> while, it's not to say that these films were not African stories, they're not African films. Why? Who's behind the camera? Take a good look, we'll go real fast. Who directed Serafina? Who directed Shaka Zulu? Who directed Hotel Rwanda? Who directed Last King of Scotland? They all have a certain you, don't they? Um, also a certain gender. <laughs> Who has the mic? They're telling me about myself. I'm digesting who I should be from these guys. And so my messaging is bound to be singular. It's bound to be othered. And so as an African woman, you're constantly in a state of cognitive dissonance because other people are telling you about yourself and you know about yourself and the two images just don't match up. So I flash forward to now, I live in LA, and actually short films do open a lot of opportunities. My short film, Chen Vu, has gotten me into rooms where people are interested in moving forward with bigger films, features, and so forth. I'm actually a huge fan of shorts. I think they're a great business card. They are like throwing money into a fire. You will never make money. Yes. And so I think it's opened up a lot of opportunities for me. And I, I walk into studios and they're like, it's such a great time, you know, for African films, Black Panther. <laughs> I'm like, Black Panther is not an African film. Black Panther is not a story about Africans. I love Black Panther. I watched it three times. I think Ryan Coogler is a genius. I love the mythical story. It's not an African story. Queen, warrior. It does not do anything to take away from the African woman being othered. Furthermore, it's, it's still through a Western lens. Because it, for you who've watched it, the idea is that this is an African country that hasn't been touched by colonization. Yet tribalism is very, very much present. That's a colonial, that's a result of colonialism. So to me, it's clear who has the mic. So for me, in, in ending, I always consider about passing the mic. There is only one way to pass the mic, because until African women tell stories about African women, we will always be othered. It's that quote, until the lion learns how to tell his own story, the hunter will always be glorified. It is that quote. And so even listening to Guido's presentation, I kept hearing the word choose. That is passing the mic. He even said, I didn't like the photo, but that's what they chose. Absolutely. That is what passing the mic is. It's saying, you know yourself better than I do. I do not understand it. I don't know why you want to do a perch flip. <laughs> but that's your choice, and we're going to allow it. That's what passing the mic is. And it 
it just gave me joy. You said it about like 15 times. They chose, they chose, they chose. It's powerful. Africa Film Festival, showcasing other films, not saying, I'm going to tell your stories. Saying, let's hear how you tell your stories. That is how you disrupt the other. African Women Film Hub, that's how you disrupt the other. You know, I was saying next year I want to, to open up a grant where I give a Ugandan woman $5,000 to create a short because I've seen what that short has done for me in my career. Um, because I also understand I cannot tell every Ugandan story. I have to pass the mic. And so whilst I'm looking for money for my own film, I also want to look for money for someone else. I have a very specific, specific privileged lens. I cannot tell certain stories. And it is important for me to recognize that and to pass the mic. Basically, I just think, am I allowed to cast Gita? Can I swear? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> um, basically, okay, so this is something people love to tell Africans, um, especially African women. Like, oh, until you tell you, if you don't tell your story, no one else will. They love to tell us that. I think it's a trap. It's a big, big trap. I believe if you don't tell your story, someone else will and they will fuck it up. <laughs> Thank you.